Hello and welcome to the Gordy and Gubbs podcast. This is episode one of what we hope will be a long running series. I'm your host, John Gubber, here in the UK. And I am Gordon Hill, former Man United winger, um, FA Cup finalist, twice with one win. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. So on today's show, this is going to be our running order. Can United make the top four and what will make this a good season? And farewell to Sir Bobby Chop. We've also got a special feature on the Finnish fan who came to Old Trafford with a rare George Best shirt worn in 1965. Wow, what a shirt. What a shirt. Absolutely fabulous. And we will be discussing whether Sir Jim Ratcliffe will make United great again. OK, fantastic. Lots to look forward to. So let's kick off, Gordon. We've had an unusual start to the season because the whole perception is that we've been awful. But when you actually look at the league table, we're only two points worse off than last season. And in the last five matches, we've won four in the Premier League. So the Premier League form is good, even if the, uh, we're not playing great. So where do you think we can go from here? Have we got a chance? I think we've got to go to playing better. We can't. I don't think we can get any worse. If we're down the bottom, yeah, there would be panic, panic, panic. But at this moment, John, there isn't panic. There's only panic because some of the games, the football side of it, is not looking clever. But if you look at the league table, it, it doesn't lie, you know. It, I think you ask the bottom clubs, they'd love to be where United are. And you, of course, Gordon, you played in a very entertaining era. A lot of us older fans, particularly, we really fondly remember the Tommy Doherty era. I mean, you know how important it is for United to play entertaining football. United have always played entertaining football. They've all had, they've always had the great stars. They've always had the bests, the the Laws, the Charltons, you know, the the, the Robsons, the Van Nistelrooy's, you know, Mark Hughes. So um, they've been renowned for playing football. The club was built on playing football. Samat to the Dock, to Ron Atkinson, to Alex Ferguson. I mean, there's always been this, that, that that's been, oh dear, we're going to United, they play football and it's entertaining football. Here we are in 2023, it's become more of a business and a lot of fans, they seem to be more concerned about results really, because when we don't win, it's a crisis and when we do win, we're going to win all the trophies. So we go from one extreme to another a little bit. So how much pressure do you think there is on Eric Ten Hag, not just to win matches, but to get back to that United way of playing? Well, I think with the media and, and how it can expose and give people the views and the airtime to express their concerns, I think you hear about, oh, he's not done this right, he's not done that right, but he's he's been the man that's been in charge or put in charge and he's paid out money for players that he thinks will do the job. So you can't keep on replacing people like that by just the sake of, oh, we need to win, we need to win. But if you look at it and say, well, OK, some of his choices, are, it, it, you're not going to please everybody. And I get it all the time on my Twitter where people say, oh, he should do this, he should do that. He gets paid to do what he thinks is right. He's going to live and die by the sword that he's got. He's picked players. He's, he, he looked at players, he's decided that he doesn't want players. And so let's not underestimate where we are and what can turn. A couple of results and everybody will say, great, great. Everybody's calling for his head. OK, fine. But we're not going to please everybody, John. This year, actually, the top five might qualify for the Champions League because if we get a team in the final, I think we get an extra place next season. So there is possible that the top five will be as good as the top four, but we yeah. won't know that until the end of the season. What I was going to say, though, Gordon, was when, when you played, you didn't have social media. So how hard is it for players like Marcus Rashford when they get criticised in social media? Do you think it makes it a lot more difficult for players like that to keep in good form? Very much so. Um, he's, un he's in the spotlight. You know, if he goes to the bathroom, they want to know what paper the he uses, which is really intruding. And, and basically what you've got to do is a young lad that's come through, that's broken into the United team, homegrown, you, you've got to let him settle. You've got to let him find his feet. And, and 
I think everybody now says, well, he's got a massive, great, you know, uh, wage increase and everything else. I think as a player, you want to play first and then at all the, you know, we used to say, there's an old saying, what you do on the field, you will get off the field. And I think with Rashford, yeah, he's going to go through some bad times. He's going to go through some good times. He's going to, that's the life of a footballer, whether you're getting a thousand pound a week or a hundred thousand pound a week. And people have got to understand that he's going to be in the spotlight. If he goes to the shops, he's in the spotlight. So people have got, people have got to accept that, John, and, and try to get the best they possibly can out of him. Absolutely. As a fan, I try not to criticise the players too much. We all have opinions of whether or not we think players are playing well, but I try and focus on the positives and I am quite excited about some of the younger players coming through. I'm wondering what you think of a winger like Garnaccio. What do you, how do you rate him? Well, Garnaccio is obviously come from a, from a different culture. So he's now looking at the premiership and he he's adjusting. You can't automatically put him in there and say, do this, do this, do this. It, 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 you can't. You've got to nurture somebody like that. You've got to help them. You've got to coach them. And that's where the four or five days a week in with the coaches that can do it to teach him the different way. He'll learn the culture of the premiership by being out there every week or, you know, even as a substitute, you learn from being a substitute what you need to do on the field to get a position. Yeah, you might sit there earning a fortune, but not playing hurts even more. Absolutely. One of the things that our football club has been famous for for decades, and I think one of the things that Sir Alex Ferguson mentioned at uh, Sir Bobby's funeral was that Sir Bobby Charlton really supported Sir Alex Ferguson, Alex Ferguson when he arrived, because he believed in the youth. And how important do you think that is still in the modern? Can it still be important in the modern game? Absolutely. It's got to be the number one priority. I mean, we, we hear all this about the club's going to do this, club's going to do that. The most, they've got to focus on the youth system. I, I am a director of my own company and I develop young players. They're the next generation of player coming through. We've watched it over time where, well, he's not reached his peak till he's 27 and now he had to reach his peak till he was 22. Now it was like 18, 19. You're now looking at players of 12 and 13 years of age that actually shine, but they're nurtured by the clubs. And I think, you know, it's like a pyramid. And you start with 20 and you eventually end up with one or two that will be in your first team. And this, and United's pyramid is very, very, very strong. And I think it is very, very powerful in terms of the players that they want. Uh, your choosing and your scouting system's got to be absolutely spot on with players that show that potential. But it, you can't just pick a player from wherever he comes from in the world and say, go in there and do it. You've got to take them in. You've got to nurture them into the way the clubs plays, the way they're structured. And and once that happens, and you can actually see as a developer, as a, as a, as a professional coach, you can see him increasing and developing. And that is really what you're looking at. Maybe one thing a season, which is, wow. But it's not. One thing a season means that he's developing. Absolutely. So we have got some, as we said, we've got some young kids coming through, but obviously in the modern game, there's no, people don't get a lot of time. So do you think Eric Ten Hag is going to get the time he needs to develop these young players? And we've not done so well with, with transfers. Perhaps we haven't got the players that he really, really wanted. So it makes it hard when you haven't got the exact players that you need to bring through these young players. No, you haven't. There are three, there are three, three categories. There's the youth category. There is the the just becoming the pro category and there's the pro category and those three have got to be an issue because number one is your youth will supply your first team but your first team then has got to be on the same wavelength they've got to win and as a youth you've got patience you have to have patience four or five years patience with these young players as a young player becoming a professional, he's now got a limited time before he actually tries to get into the first team. And then you've got your first team that are actually there and they've got to play to keep out those young players coming through, which is 
you know, like a dog eat dog situation. And, and, but the youth is the ones where you get say 20 young players come through. And then all of a sudden you'll find five, six of them have been signed professional with potential to becoming professionals. And then maybe one of them might, two of them, three, it might get a chance of being in the first team squad. But what you're doing is not only teaching them on the field, you're also teaching them the way the club is structured, that you, you, you've got to learn the situation before you actually get put into it. And then you get a little bit, maybe five minutes of a game. You might be, and this is what the clubs are all about with pre-seasons, John. The pre-seasons are for the young players to see who's developing, who's not. And then you get the players that will not develop. And unfortunately, they will be loaned out to clubs with the view of them developing to come back into the club, which we've seen. So there are a lot of avenues that can be done, but the bottom of the pyramid, John, has to be the youth system. Has to be. And if we go back in history, obviously Manchester United pioneered the development of youth with the Busby Babes in the first five years of the FA Youth Cup, Jimmy Murphy. He, uh, he brought through the kids who, who won the FA Youth Cup for the first five years. Time to move on to talk about Sir Bobby Charlton, who, of course, was one of those Busby Babes. And uh, when Bobby sadly passed away, he was the final survivor from the Babes who came through the Munich air disaster. So I'm just wondering, I was there filming the uh, funeral cortege when it passed the Trinity statue in the East Stand. And we saw fans lining the route all the way to the Manchester Cathedral, where we had many famous faces, some of the ones that you would, I'm sure, know from Manchester United. I'm just wondering what kind of reaction there was over in the United States of America. We always talk proudly about how Sir Bobby Charlton was known in every country in the world. What kind of reaction did we get over in the States? It wasn't, shall we say, an out-and-out out parade, so to speak. It was on the news that Sir Bobby had passed away, his funeral was. And to be honest with you, nothing really, John, which, which doesn't surprise me about the States. Nothing really. For me, coming from, from home, from England, playing in London, playing up at the fabulous Old Trafford, knowing Bobby. It it was a bit of a dampener, really, to be honest with. For me, you know, because I didn't, you know, people normally at home that have said, oh, what do you think? You know, did, did you know Bobby? Yes. And was he a nice guy and all that? Yes. That all goes before everybody here. It, it, you know, they have three other sports, basketball, baseball, football. So you're, you know, you get more notoriety from somebody in the baseball, basketball or NFL football as opposed to that. And it, it, it opens your eyes up to the culture and the culture of our game and the culture of Manchester United. Yes, everybody knows they're famous. They'll always be famous, doesn't matter what business they do, who owns it. It's an institution and it's an institution in football that will be forever and ever and ever. And here, you, you, you know, people say, oh, you, you played for Manchester United. Isn't it that? And you, and you have to stop them. You say, yes, it was Man United. The f yeah, I said, and you have to rely then on just say, well, go to go to my YouTube page and look it up yourself. You don't want to blow your own trumpet, but you know, people said, I said, well, if you don't know Sir Bobby, I said, just go on YouTube and you'll see what a great person he was and a great player. So you're really trying to reiterate all the time, the, 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 the boldness and, the, and you know, the, 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 this is United, so to speak, but you're also, you're also trying to, make the the game grow as well you know and i love it i've always loved it but explaining what man united is is really great because the media can explain it a lot lot better when they look at the you know the the the, the theater of dreams absolutely i was lucky enough to grow up watching best law and charlton and uh you, of course were lucky enough to play for manchester united and england so you know you saw firsthand what an impact a uh, Sir Bobby Charlton had at both club and national level. And uh, it's been said by so many people what a great statesman he was for the game of football. But how, how do you remember Sir Bobby Charlton? Well, I, I had time for United and, and Bobby used to keep, was training with us because he was still at the latter part. And I think when he trained with us, 
I always remember one training session where Stevie and I were doing something and we were very quick. We were very sharp and we did it at Carrington and it came in and Bobby was going for a ball. And then all of a sudden I got in there and it was in the back of the net. And I, and you could see then, and, and I think he realized that it was time to say goodbye. It was, you know, um, I'm now going to leave it to the new generation, which was, which was lovely because he wasn't a man of many words, Bobby, but what he said was meaningful, was, you know, hey, Bob, you can still, you know, Bob, you know, we enjoy you coming out here. And then he said, yeah, but when people are going past you, and I found out the same way, when younger players are going past you, it's the time to say, I think it's about time I hang up the boots and then look for a, a, another avenue. And he was a gentleman. I mean, he was very, 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 you know, polite. Uh, always had a very, very three or four word sentence to end it. You know, hey, keep going. Um, never mind. Don't worry about it. It will sort itself out. Just keep playing the way you are. And then get, and that was it, really. And so, you know, knowing Bobby, you know, and also, you know, to a quick change, I knew his brother Jack as well. And completely opposite. Jack would be a thousand words. Bobby would be two words, but the two words meant a little bit more than what, it, what Jack's thousand was. But both, both, you know, lovely, lovely guys. And, and I, I'm, I was... I'm blessed to have played at the club, but I was blessed to train with Bobby, you know. And when he uh, when he passed away, I think it was a it was a dent in everybody that knows United, and uh, you know can't be replaced. Very much so. You arrived at Manchester United at a very interesting time, really, because we were just coming at a time when we needed to try and replace Best Lawrence Charlton. I mean, they were obviously finished and. Uh, probably a good opportunity to move on to talk about Georgie Best. And he was my boyhood hero. I mean, I, as I said, I grew up watching Best Law and Charlton. Georgie Best was the guy that most people of my age wanted to be. <laughs> but Bobby yeah. was the man that we all uh, we all respected because he was like, a, he was even when he was a player, he, he almost felt like he was an ambassador of football. He and was he became, a statesman, wasn't he? Exactly, yeah. And uh, I always say when, when Manchester United players stop playing football, they become fans. But, Bobby was almost like the ultimate fan because he stayed so close to the team. And when we hear all the interviews that we've heard over the last couple of weeks since he since he passed away, we realised how close he stayed with the football club and how he was influential in keeping Sir Alex Ferguson at the club at a time when he possibly could have been pushed out. So uh, we always think, uh, one of the things we talk about with Ten Hag really, we, we want to see him get enough time to do the job. But on yeah. the other hand, we don't want him to stay too long if he's not the right man. So it's always a difficult decision. But I think with... Sir Alex Ferguson's case, Bobby Charlton was very much a, a fantastic asset for Sir Alex Ferguson, partly because he wanted to keep the youth, he wanted to develop the youth, and that's going back to that same subject again. Anyway, I just want to move on to to talking about Sir George, uh, talking about Georgie Best. I call him Sir Georgie <laughs> Best. To me, he was Sir, but <laughs> a lot of our players could have been knighted who weren't, and uh, Harry Gregg was one of those that I think should have been knighted. But a story that many people possibly don't know is a good friend of mine, over in Helsinki, Yera Vertan, and he's got his own museum. Well, a few weeks ago, I was at the 60th anniversary of the George Best debut. We had a dinner at Old Trafford, and uh, George's sister, Barbara, her husband, Norman, said he made a public statement saying he didn't think there was enough memorabilia at uh, Old Trafford uh, representing George Best. So Yera brought over a shirt at the weekend that was used in 1965 in a match when United played against Helsinki. I know you played over in Helsinki. So uh, I, I wonder what you think of uh, the, the shirt coming over from uh, from Finland to, to come into the, the museum at Manchester United. Uh, I think it's fantastic. I mean, when I played over in, I played for Hoi Koi, Helsinki, and um, the the fans over there, were, you know, were, were uh, Liverpool, Man United, they were, and, and they were fans. And uh, they would travel over. You'd get a few travel over every Saturday to watch the game. But when I heard about, you know, that great uh, trip that you had. And then um, 
you, them having a 65 George Best shirt must have, it to me was just like, wow, because I got to know George because I, I, I virtually took over George's number and I didn't, when you, you can't replace a player like George, you know, George was unique. George sits up there with the best for me. He's, he's far in my number one heights than, than, than people like Messi or Ronaldo, because George was George, George, you know, George was, um, the fifth Beatle. We, we all, we all hear about and meeting George was George would give you a shirt off his back, which obviously he's done on with his 65 shirt, which is great. But George was very kind. George would, would, if, if, if somebody would never had any money, he'd give him a couple of quid out of his pocket. That was George, you know, and it might be his last couple of quid. And uh, I had the pleasure of taking George to Dublin to raise money for the uh, three teams, uh, St. Pat, Cherry Orchard and Home Farm. And we had a, a great weekend with, I mean, the players that I got over, you couldn't buy them. And so Alex was the manager. And then we played against an air team, uh, uh, Southern Ireland, and it was just brilliant. And we played there just outside Dublin. And George was there and George was, 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 unbelievable but it was a time of george's life where george was underneath the influence of alcohol and you know so we had to bear with him and everything else and you know alex's wife was superb at the time and she we got him over we'd done the bits and pieces and it was absolutely brilliant he came and the, the nice thing about it is he turned up which was and and that's that's that was worth the weight in gold and and everything else went and uh, the players and everything else and that's a memory and we raised about twenty five thousand pound for the, the the kids of Dublin so that was my memory and I sat down with George when I was at United and had a had a quick chat with George and then I met him again when we was in the States together when he was playing for San Jose and I was playing for Montreal and we sat there and on the field uh, we, we, we'd have a five minute chat on the field when the game was still going ahead and the ball was running going around and and it was and George would, you know, Jake Gordon, he said, hey, what do you, and then all of a sudden you'd be saying, yeah, George, do you miss home? Oh, yeah, George. And you'd be talking on the field and then you'd get the wake up call and get, and guess who was uh, our manager at the time was the great Bill Fox. <laughs> so Bill Fox would have a go at us for having a chin wag. And that was when I was with Chicago Sting. So it, the, you might be miles away from, Old Trafford, but that camaraderie still sat. And I think those memories will stay with me forever and ever and ever. And uh, now I just look at the new players coming through and I just hope that the they have the same memories. Mm. Fantastic memories to have. It's great to hear mm -hmm. about George Best, the person, not just George Best, the football player. We all know he was Fantastic. a great football player. He speaks player. for himself, John. It's nice to hear about him as a, as, a, as a nice personality and a nice person, a generous person. I've always heard that from many people, including, uh, including his ex-wife, actually. <laughs> she always <laughs> talked about how shy he was when, uh, when the media came around. And he, uh, he just he liked a little bit of privacy. He didn't really get enough privacy and everybody wanted to no. buy him a drink. It probably contributed to him. I'm sure it did uh, contribute to him having his alcohol problem. What was interesting about the shirt that uh, Yerra brought over was that it was number eight shirt. We don't often see. We didn't often see George in the number eight shirt. But in those days, we had number of numbers one to eleven. It was. Uh, I like that. I like the old fashioned numbers one to eleven. To be honest, and uh, I guess we'll never go back to that. It's all like American no. football now. We, we're just like to see number sixty eight or ninety nine than we are a number eleven or a number eight. But uh, it's quite an, an interesting shirt, and it was in fantastic condition. It was presented to uh, Wes Brown. I filmed the presentation there in the eighteen seventy eight suite, and they had a. A match beforehand, uh, Wes Brown and uh, Lee Martin, the FA Cup final goal scorer yeah. in 1990, and uh, Ben Thornley and Russell Beardsmore. Well, they all played in a little match against some guys from Finland. It was a little, uh, little bit of a, a treat for the guys who came over from Finland, but it, it made it a nice little day out, really. And, uh, and then the shirt was presented to Wes Brown on behalf of the museum. 
There we are. Brilliant. It's going to be something interesting for fans to get to see in the museum because there isn't an awful lot of George Best memorabilia in the museum. No, and that's a shame. I mean, you know, they've got the, 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 the teams, you know, I've been in there a couple of times and it's nice to be able to see some of your memorabilia in the museum. I mean, to, to let everybody, and, and I mean everybody around the world, you know, it is, you go in the museum and it is a theatre of dreams in the football world. And, and you look at it and you, you tend to want to see, you know, oh, where's George? I mean, they've got a lot of Sir Bobby, fabulous. But I, I looked and I said, I, it was it would be nice to have seen George, you know, and it, it's strange, but you just read a couple of captions from some of the items and that's that's enough because, you know, you go and then you move on and there's somebody else and then all of a sudden there's Brian Robson and then there's somebody else and somebody else. And it's really nice to actually see that. And you think that, once when there wasn't a museum and now there is a museum and now it's flourishing and now you've got memorabilia in there from 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 every person that you can possibly think of and i should say the people that stand out that's a bobby dennis bobby um dennis um george you know uh all the greats i mean I used to enjoy sitting at the former Man United dinners. That's where we raised a lot of money for, you know, it's an association of former Man United players. And I'm, I'm very pleased that I'm part of it, but I can see it not surviving because the players that are playing nowadays don't come from where we come from. They, they'll go back to their countries or do whatever they need to do. And, and which is, which is sad, but, you, you've got the greats, you know, and, and to see every one of them. I sat with the remains of one, uh, the remaining members of the 48 cup winning side. And I just sat there, John, and I just listened to these people, these players talking about getting the bus to the ground. Someone stole their bike. And, and to get to the ground, you know, and then all of a sudden it comes into our era where, well, I got a new car and this was great. And, and, and I remember Jim Holton saying to Jerry Daly, you know, giving him his Vauxhall 2000 for getting into the World Cup in Argentina. And now all of a sudden, now you're looking at players now that have got massive great houses that are getting six million pound renovations and bits and pieces so times have changed and i like to keep up with the times and now looking at the the players now and i study a lot of the players now i look at what they are what they're doing and there's not much difference except that now it is very money orientated absolutely and, must and have been absolutely must have been absolutely mesmerizing to talk to the guys from 1948 i was lucky enough to get quite friendly with jack crompton who was a goalkeeper in 1948 yes before he passed away and uh, Harry Gregg another goalkeeper he was quite instrumental yeah. in setting up the association of former Manchester United players of course now we have this fantastic history and uh, we have a, as we talked about the museum we've got some great memorabilia in the museum but uh, as fans we all now want to look forward to the future so the big talking point obviously for the last year or well, one of the biggest talking points has been about the ownership and uh, Sir Jim Ratcliffe. Personally, I'm pleased that Sir Jim Ratcliffe seems to be the man who's going to be leading the uh, the new the new ownership model because he is a man from Manchester. He, he is a man who grew up supporting Manchester United. And he understands the history, and I think that's important. How hard do you think yeah. it's going to be for Sir Jim Ratcliffe now to to make a difference at Manchester United? Well, I don't think it. I don't think it's going to be hard in or it cannot be done. I mean, if you look at what he's actually done with his own company and who he's involved with in terms of the F1, um, uh, the All Blacks rugby team, what they're actually doing now in sport is that they've got a couple of couple of clubs that that they've got, and the 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 interest in Man United. I, I you know, if you're talking to somebody like Jim, who who has been a, a, a United supporter all his life, he he. Mentioned one, and I listened to it very carefully. One thing he just said, it's all about the money. And and we're, we're lucky enough to have somebody that wants to be part of it, even though it's only 20, 
that wants to be able to put the club on the same ground in. And he's looking at um, he's looking at Sir Alex coming and giving him being his advisor. Uh, you're looking at people that are established, so to speak. Um, uh, Jean Claude Jean Claude Blanc, he's from Juventus. You know Mitchell, that's uh, come in as well. So they are getting pedigree people in there that have been involved in the, the high flying side of the club. You know Richard Arnold done it. That you know was put in a situation and, and has done very well. He's 16 years there, so he's he done very well. You know, uh, you've got people in there. John Murchock, he's got, it looks like that he may have to be stepping down. We've seen that Jim's already made some quotes about people stepping down. And then you look at the team and that's been left to uh, Eric Den Haag. And you've got to give him, you've got to give him his, his mile. You gotta, you know, be patient. You can't keep on changing. You know, we all, after a game, if it's a, if a, if it's a loss, oh gosh, well, get rid of him, get rid of him. In and you can say things in the heat of the moment, but if you look at it in a, on a on a realistic side of a running a club, you have gotta look at Ten Hag doing his job on the field, making sure that's great. You've got then the people on the back of that. That are, that are on the administration side of it that make sure that things can happen. Then you've got to look at the buying and selling of players that are not going to be. So there are a lot of departments, which I said earlier, that have to come into play here, but you have to have the right people. And I think what Jim is doing, he's getting together people that are um, well known in their field. You know, know the job, know what it takes, know that this is, this is, this United is United. We'll take that apart. We'll put that to the side. You're now looking at the business. And I think the business side of it will, 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 will come through because you've got the, the pros in it. And then you've got, the, you've got the, pro, you've got the pro coaches in it as well. It's just, you've got to give him a bit of patience. You have to have patience with Ten Hag. His buys, you know, we're hearing it every day about players going and players coming. It's nothing new in any club. And I think the Christmas period, which we will talk about, John, over the next couple of weeks, will really show us exactly, yes, there's a little bit more settlement in the structure up the management side. Now there's a bit of structure in the playing side of it. Players are going to go. Because don't forget, you got the January transfer window, and there's going to be a, it's it's what we call driftwood that has to go, being able to afford to come in. But you can't spend millions, and I'm talking millions, and not get a good return for it. That then comes into your young players again, so it it comes back and says, well, okay, we haven't got. 100 million to spend on a player what have we got coming through now you've got to look at what's coming through and if you look at what city did with palmer they brought palmer through but then i tell you he wasn't getting the game so they got him over to chelsea and what is now playing in, at chelsea and doing well that's the type of things that we've got we we've got and we have to do to maybe farm our younger players out to clubs to get them. We did it with Beckham. He went out to come back. That never changes. So when people talk about, oh, we need to do this, we need to do this, it's already in place. It just needs to be tightened up. It just needs to be put to the test. And I think with, with to Jim, I think he's got a plan. I think if he's brought, he's brought in... Uh, Patrick Stewart as an interim CEO, which he will, and then basically what they'll do is sit down and go through it from top to bottom. But they've done it at F1. They've done it with the rugby. They've done it in the bice, in the in the cyclist, you know. So I don't see why it can't work at Man United. Man United stand alone. Man United, it's like a castle on its own. It's an institution on its own. Now we've got to see how we can make that institution work. But also, number one, we have to put the finished product 
on the field because we have 70, 75,000 people every week looking for something like, give us, a, you know, show us now, show us, is it wasted? Is it not wasted? You know, and what time will tell. Absolutely. I think we should point out that it's not actually been confirmed yet that Sir Jim Ratcliffe is going to be at no. on the 20th then. But it seems pretty clear because everybody's reporting the same story and it seems that uh, it's, they've done a lot of groundwork in getting people lined up as potential people to be CEO like uh, Jean-Claude Blanc and you've got the potential director of football. Paul Mitchell seems to be one of the favourites. Well, John, there's, John there's, there's five. Five people that, that Sir Jim has got on his list. It's all about selecting and making the right decisions. What, what I've encouraged by is the fact that we've got a guy who really wants to sort it out because before we had the football, we had Richard Arnold, who might have done a good job from the commercial yes. side, but re, the reality was, he was a, he's, an, he's a former accountant. He's not a football man as such. And he was really the sort of, he was really putting into place what Joel Glazer wanted. And Joel Glazer was sitting in an office over in America and he was very detached from what was going on at Old Trafford, he's not a yeah. football. He's not a football lover. He might, he might say he's a Manchester United supporter, but he doesn't really know much about running the game. So we've got a man now in Sir, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, who's got this sort, sort of sporting centre of excellence where they look after multi sports. Yes, his, his job now is to get the right. His job now is to get the right people in. So, as you've been saying, really, it's all about getting everybody to work together, getting Eric Ten Hag and the, the whole support system to be working and singing from the same same hymn sheet. So I I feel encouraged. I'm not saying that Sir Jim Ratcliffe is going to be the hero guaranteed, but I'm more hopeful no. having someone like Sir Jim Ratcliffe than having, say, personally, I didn't want state ownership because that was always going to be about... I don't, I don't think, John, that you've got a person there that will sit back and let things happen without a purpose, without knowing. You, you don't go into different sports and make it successful. And he, he came out with it and he said... And, and I listened very carefully to what he said. The sports are great, but it's all about money. And that, and that tells you, you know, okay, fine. If the money's available, do we, you know, do we buy the team? Do we buy a winning team? And you can't buy a winning team. You might put them together, but you can't guarantee they're going to play. Uh, you know, it's like having a thoroughbred horse. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to, if they don't win, are you going to shoot the horse or get rid of the jockey? And Eric Ten Hag is the jockey at the moment that is trying to get this thoroughbred. And it's the biggest thoroughbred. It's, it's, you know, it's priceless. And if he can do it and get some success, and don't forget, you're in the shadow of Sir Alex Ferguson all the time. And which, which you know, Rude Hullet said it. You can't live in that memory anymore. You have to come out of that memory. And I think, and, and that's a very, very big statement coming out. And I agree with it. You can't live in that. That was fantastic. That was brilliant. That was wow. But now you've got to give Ten Hag that, the reins of that horse. And you've got, you know, you're running in the, the national every week because. It is Man United. It's not. It was. It's not Millwall. It's sometimes John. I I look at it and I go, wow. You know how much more turning is it going to be? But if you basically boil it down to is the team on the field on a Saturday, players coming through that can produce it, youth system for players coming through, and the big one now is the administration to make sure all that gets put together. Whether we like it whether I get opinions, my Twitter account lights up like a Christmas tree. I've got nearly 50,000 people to have a crack. Yeah, what I'd say is my opinion. And this is why I think you and I doing this and coming out on our podcasts will be able to highlight every situation that happens at the weekend. Win or lose, I'm going to be straight down the middle. We're not always going to be controversial and we just give our honest, honest opinions. And we've both seen how the game's changed over the decades because we're getting yes. on a little bit. But uh, we're just going to give it a go and see what happens. I mean, we, there's no guarantees, but hopefully if people want to see more of the podcast, we'll, we'll do it on a more regular basis. I mean, this is kind of a little bit of an experiment. I want people to, to, to give us questions, 
you know, send in to us what you'd like to hear, what you know, and uh, give our views. I'll give my views on it. You know, I'll give my views from the field. I'll give my views from wearing that red shirt. I will one. I will wear a Man United 1977 shirt on the podcast, and no one else has got that shirt. <laughs> Not giving still, it away. It's still one of the most popular shirts. That one, Gordon. Anyway, it it's is. been great. I think we're starting to run out of time. We, 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 when you and I talk, we can talk all night. So uh, let's oh. save some for next time and let, let's try and get yes. some feedback because if people can tell us what they like, what they don't like, have they got questions? I mean, hopefully in the future we can do it live, but at the moment we're still getting the uh, the format sorted out and uh, let people, hopefully people let us know if they like us. I'm sure they will because people always tell us when we don't like things, but <laughs> I don't mind getting some criticism as long as we get some positive stuff as well. But uh, anyway, Gordon, it's been an absolute pleasure again speaking to you. And uh, I'm not sure when we're going to do the next one, whether we're going to do it next week or the week after, because uh, there okay. are some other things going on that I need to tackle at the moment and uh, with family issues. But uh, let's see how this one goes and uh, hopefully we'll be back very soon. I'd, I'd also like to say about the Kevin Beatty Foundation that they've got a memorial coming up for Paul Mariner on the 3rd of March at uh, for Plymouth, at Plymouth Argyle. And Paul was a was one of my best friends that passed away with uh, brain tumour. And so um, I want to give a shout out that, that, that they do a great they do a great job and uh, to lose my mate and uh, get told, you know, I still have his texts on my phone. So bless his heart, rest in peace, Maris. And obviously Kevin Beatty as well at Ipswich, who was uh, uh, a man giant, you know, a boy giant, if you want to call him that. So I wish them all the very best for that. And uh, I know that um, we'll be talking more. We'll give that as much support as we can, Gordon. Now, I was lucky enough to know all those guys that you, you, you mentioned there. And uh, I did do a video actually a year or so ago during lockdown to in support of the Kevin Beatty Foundation. So I'll put a link yeah. into that in the uh, in the description so people can find out through that link more about the upcoming uh, night, the uh, the tribute evening, the, the, the uh, fundraising yeah. for, for Paul Marin. And we'll, we'll keep people updated on that one. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's that. brilliant. That's brilliant. Thanks. Cheers. See you next time, Gordon. Take care, John, and uh, look at the results. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it always affects my weekend. <laughs> <laughs>